Welcome to the Hair of the Dog podcast. I'm Nicole Bagley, and today we are bringing you a best of series. We are reaching into the archives, and we are bringing you the best of location scouting secrets with Charlotte Reeves. This was originally way back in episode number 17, and it was an incredible conversation that I had with my friend Charlotte about how to get the best out of our locations, how to find our locations, and really just all things location scouting. You're going to love it. So go ahead and stay tuned. Welcome to the Hair of the Dog podcast. If you're a pet photographer ready to make more money and start living a life by your design, you've come to the right place. And now, your host, pet photographer, travel addict, chocolate martini connoisseur, Nicole Begley. Hey, everybody. Nicole here from Hair of the Dog, and I am here with the one and only Charlotte Reeves from Charlotte Reeves Photography and Learn Pet Photography down in Brisbane, Australia. Hey, Charlotte, thanks for joining us today. Hey, Nicole. I'm awesomely happy to be here. <laughs> this is great. Me too. Me too. So Charlotte and I are good friends. We've been teaching um, the Barka series. So Barkalona, Barklander, Bark Zealand, all the Barkas, me, her, and Kaylee Greer started those it's been four years can you believe it's, it's been, been four years yeah, i cannot believe it's been that long it's crazy since the first one but um yeah it's <laughs> nuts and we're actually supposed to be in scotland right, right now, now which is very very sad <laughs> <laughs> very but we sad. will get there again <laughs> yeah we'll get there eventually yes yes so yeah so charlotte and i um yeah i've been teaching together and then we work together a lot in hair of the dog she is a coach in our elevate program and also in the academy does the critique corners um, every month where people get feedback on their images. And so, yeah, so I work really closely with Charlotte and she is, I must say, a master of the art of pet photography um, when especially harnessing natural light in really any situation. Oh, thank um, you. No, you're so welcome. Yeah, <laughs> so beautiful and dreamy and warm. Yeah, so I guess, Charlotte, tell us a little bit about your background and how you stumbled into this whole pet photography world. Okay, sure. Well, it was uh, 13 years ago now. Um, so it was sort of 2007 and I'd, I'd studied photography after I left high school. So I actually did a two-year diploma of photography at college when I left high school and I couldn't really decide what, decide what I wanted to specialize in. So I, you know, I did landscape photography and I photographed cars because I was into cars back then and um, it never Never really dawned on me to photograph, you know, pets or animals or anything like that at the time. I knew I didn't want to be a wedding photographer. I knew I didn't want to like <laughs> photograph people. And so I just couldn't really settle on what I wanted to do at the time. So I ended up going on to further study in graphic design and website design. And so I did another three years at college. So in total, I did five years at college and I ended up working as a website designer and also as a graphic designer. And it oh, wasn't yep. until I actually got my first dog, uh, which is, I think is the story for so many people actually. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I got my first dog and she was a Great Dane uh, called Kaya. And I started taking photos of her to document her first year. So as you know, Great Danes start out kind of, well, even they actually start out quite large as well for puppies. <laughs> <laughs> but they start out they have a lot of growing though that first year they for sure. <laughs> yeah. And I really wanted to document that as she grew from a, a, a smallish kind of puppy into like this very, very large dog. Um, so I started a photo blog for her and I actually submitted some photos to the Daily Puppy, which I don't know if it exists anymore. It was a website. Was it a blog? Then. Yeah, it was a blog. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Um, and so I started getting a lot of followers through through that blog to my blog, and I ended, then I ended up sort of wanting to, I guess, delve back into photography a little bit more. So I started doing a photo a day project in 2007. So I did one photo every day for that entire year. A lot of the photos ended up being of her, but I tried to kind of like keep it separate, I guess, um, so I could kind of try and expand my photography skills uh, and yeah. sort of get back get back into the swing of things with photography. But I, I eventually just ended up taking lots of photos of her and I thought, oh, I don't know if I, I wonder if I can do something with this. So at the time there was a photographer in Seattle called Erin Vay and she also had a fawn Great Dane and she was a pet photographer 
and I found her online and I was like, wow, this is actually a thing. There are people doing this, you know, because it never really <laughs> yeah. like, occurred yeah. to me before. <laughs> At least one other person. Yes. <laughs> it's so like, funny um, back then. It was so few. That's right. And she was in America too. So she wasn't even in Australia. Um, right. I, I, I couldn't really find anyone who was doing it in Australia other than people who were doing it in studio and even not like only pets in studio, kind of pets in studio in addition to other things like people in the studio as well. Um, yep. So anyway, I figured if she was doing it, I could do it. So <laughs> I, ended up, I ended up just uh, starting a business of, of being a, and I, I mainly just called it dog photography back then, being a dog photographer. And then I got my second Great Dane and then it just kind of all built from there. But it was, it was kind of felt like a bit of a pioneering thing at the time because there was no one else doing it. And I feel like I had to do so much education of people. Yes. Um, that this was actually a thing, you know? Yeah. I think a lot of people, it's funny because depending on their perspective, they could look at, okay, I'm in a city with a whole bunch of other pet photographers as, oh my gosh, there's so many pet photographers. I'm never going to get any work. Um, yep. Or, oh my gosh, look at all these other pet photographers. That means there's a lot of work here. Or they yep. <laughs> are like letting the market know that this is a thing because exactly. I think still it's it's better now in 2020 than it used to be that people are not totally flabbergasted that pet photography is a thing. Some exactly. are. Exactly. <laughs> people know of it now. People know yeah. of it. Yeah. There are yeah. obviously still some people that are like, you're a what? <laughs> uh -huh, right. Right. But yeah, back when you started, I mean, you had to educate the entire marketplace that this was a thing plus exactly. then get them to, you know, see the value in it. Exactly. Yeah. And it was a, it was a bit of a struggle really. Um, but I think also people, because it was such a new thing, it was, it kind of captured people and engaged them. And they were kind of like, Oh, that's really cool. Like I haven't heard of that before. Wow. Right. <laughs> so it was such a new thing that it kind of had that edge over other things or other styles of photography, I suppose. Yeah. But yeah, I eventually got there and then more, you know, it became more popular over the year, years and more pet photographers started sort of popping up. And I guess I kind of started calling myself a, a pet photographer as well because I wanted to um, wanted to let people know that I could do, you know, cats and horses and all that sort of thing as well. Right. And it's funny because kind of now I've gone back to pretty much just dogs. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so I've, yeah. I've, done, I've done the full circle. I started out as a dog photographer and then went through pets and now I'm like, no, I'm just going to kind of specialize in what I what I know and what I'm really good at and what I enjoy and that's just dogs so um, right, right. that's really good to see today too actually um, there's a lot of people that are just doing you know horses or yeah. there's even a few photographers out there who are just doing cats you know right so it's really great right. to see people niching down within a niche and I think that right. also gives people an edge as well yeah, yeah I think it's a good thing absolutely I just spoke yeah. with them. I just did a podcast with Shelly Paulson, um, oh, who awesome. is yeah an amazing equine photographer. And yeah, and it just, I think, comes down to following your your heart and your passion and what you really love to photograph. And, exactly. you know, you can make a niche in any of those spots. Yeah. And if you've got the passion for it and, and the, the more that you do it, actually, the more knowledge and skills you have in that particular tiny little niche and the better you get at it rather than sort of specializing in a number of things, you like, truly specialize in one thing. Right. I think it's a big advantage, actually. Yeah, absolutely. And then you can have all your marketing, all your websites, all your images, all your messaging all go towards that one thing. It just makes life so much easier. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. It's actually, it's amazing that number of times you see, you know, you hear about a, a like a new pet photographer joins a group or contacts you and you go to their website or you go to their Instagram or whatever. And there are, you know, a few dogs and stuff there, but it's all mixed in with right. like babies and kids and weddings and all that sort of thing. And you're like, oh man, that's just like such a mixed messaging right. kind of thing right. going on there. Yeah, because um, all the target markets are so different. Like if I'm a bride, so I don't want to see babies. And, you know, if I'm a newborn, I don't want, you know, or a mom of a newborn, I don't want to see someone's cat or dog. So exactly. it's, yeah, definitely yeah, want to be able to separate that experience. Yeah. And I think that's also how some people fail to get um, the, the followers, the social media followers that they really want to get. Um, right. Is because their, their Instagram account or whatever isn't specialized enough and people don't follow because they're like, oh, I really like their dog photos, but oh, I don't really want to see babies all the time as well. Right, so right. I just won't bother following them, you know. Um, yep. So the more specialized you are in your social media as well, the more likely people will follow you because it's that one particular thing that they're really interested in. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. 
Nice. Yeah. So when you, so you've started with uh, about 13 years ago and then you had your graphic design and web design, which by the way, are like the most um, just fantastic commingling of skills to run a (laughs) photography business. because It's super super handy. (laughs) I know. I know I am not um, graphically gifted. So I definitely (laughs) hire out for all of that. But what a great skill to have for for all of those things. (laughs) Oh, it it comes, it really comes in handy being able to do all that. It really does. It's the best combination, especially when it comes to like creating learning resources. And even my books that I did, Tales of Brisbane, like I designed all that and wrote all that and laid it all out. Um, And so my graphic design background really came in handy there. And then, yeah, I guess with anything marketing related or anything like that. Yeah. Yeah. It's good to have that, that knowledge, I suppose. Yep. Yep. If you don't have that knowledge out there, you can always outsource it like I do. That's exactly right. Yes. It's not it's not a requirement. It's just a handy thing. (laughs) Definitely not a requirement. I always like to say things either cost time or money. It's gonna either cost you money to have (laughs) someone do it or a lot of time to figure it out. But like when I started, I didn't know anything about web design. So I made my own website. Was it the most beautiful thing? No. Did it do the job? Yes. (laughs) You know, and then you learn more and you yeah, and you you tweak it and then eventually you have enough money to invest to have somebody an actual professional. Exactly. <laughs> and that makes Which, that makes all the difference too. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so yeah. So you are in like one of the sunniest places on the planet. And <laughs> I yes. used to live in Pittsburgh. Yeah. which um, I've seen, I've seen conflicting reports, but the most recent one I saw, which was the cloudiest city in the United States. We have more cloudy wow. days than Seattle. Wow. Um, I mean, cause it literally becomes cloudy well, around early November and you don't yep. really see the sun again. Even now my mom's back up there now and she's like, Oh my God, it's raining almost every Aww. day where it's just like cloudy, cloudy, cloudy until like June. So you have a couple months of intermittent sun, not every day. <laughs> <laughs> where wow. now I live in Charlotte and like yep. it's sunny here a lot. So yeah. <laughs> I almost finding that, oh my gosh, my my style is almost changing here. And you and I have had yeah. conversations about we have, where yeah. you live and how that might affect your style because Definitely. I mean, your, your style is so backlit and sun drenched and beautiful. And mine has become like more like I really love to use the architecture and yep. like the the city vibes and it's like kind of monochromatic and yeah. yeah. And that's definitely a product of the sort of light that you have to work with. It's a huge contributor. Like I often think if I, because I love Scotland, if I would have, you know, somehow grown up in Scotland and started right. my business in Scotland, I think my style would be completely different. I think yep. it would be quite, it would be quite, you know, moody and dark and dramatic. And I might be using, you know, off camera flash more to create some, um, some life and interest in my images. Uh, whereas I don't use it at all, uh, where I live here because I don't need to, I, I feel I don't need to. Right. So, um, right. You have so much light to work with. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. We have a lot of sunny days. So I actually don't even shoot on a cloudy day. So if I have a client session scheduled, I watch the weather forecast. And if there's more than say yep. 70% cloud forecast for that afternoon, I will reschedule. Um, and it's just I basically. Love you guys I, have a cloud. I, was saying, I love cloud you guys cover. have a cloud forecast. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we don't well, have we a cloud need to know forecast. these things. <laughs> I actually that's pay fantastic. extra. I'm a, I'm a massive, probably like most photographers that work outdoors. I'm a massive weather nerd as well. Oh yeah. So I, uh-huh. I pay I pay extra for a subscription for a weather website that actually gives me all this data that I use to oh, nice. decide whether to go ahead with a session or not. Um, yep. But yeah, I, I also, think I have. I, say, I think I have seven weather apps on my phone. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> One actually that we downloaded in uh, when we were in New Zealand because we had yep. some rain. We were trying to dodge. Um, so I downloaded one down there. It's still in Celsius. So that one's my one that I'm learning what <laughs> oh, okay. Celsius means. I go there. <laughs> <laughs> That's helpful. It is. It is. Super helpful. <laughs> I'm still not real great on the Fahrenheit thing. There's a couple of reference temperatures I kind of understand, but yeah. It's, right. yeah. And then you estimate everything else. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I just guess basically. Yeah. I um, love it. I love it. But um, yeah, no, I, I really educate my clients too, that that is something that I really need to have in my, in my sessions to be able to create the style that they see on my website. Um, So it's not a surprise for them if we need to reschedule because it's cloudy because I've I've told them at multiple points up 
up until the day that, you know, if there's more than 70% cloud on the forecast, we're going to have to reschedule to a sunny day. So I think that communication, like being open with your communication with that sort of mm-hmm. thing is really important as well. Just managing yeah. man- managing people's expectations, I suppose. So you're not just springing Absolutely. these lots of things on them and they're like, what? Are you kidding me? Why can't you shoot when it's cloudy? <laughs> right, it's right. It's not raining. <laughs> Yeah, Yeah, no, for sure. I think that that is 100% such an important part of our process is to make sure our clients know what's coming next and what the possibilities are and what our expectations are. And my kind of rule of thumb is anytime I have contact with a client, I always let them know when they'll hear from me again and what they can expect next, which is kind of an easy way to, to keep them in the loop. Definitely. So they're not, they're never left wondering as to what the next point of contact or task or meeting or whatever is. Yep. For sure. Yep. For sure. Definitely. So when you started, did you always start with products or did you start with the shoot and burn? What was that? What was your um, uh, beginning years like? I actually never did shoot and burn. I always did products. Yeah, um, nice. And I, th- I think that's because I'm not sure why that is. I think I think that's because when I did uh, when I studied photography, it was actually before digital. Uh, um, yep. So it was just before digital. So we had a couple of digital cameras when I was at college, but they were like two megapixel toys. Right. Like they weren't a serious thing. So I guess I kind of right from the very start of my photography journey, like I always had products in mind. Like I always had, you know, prints and wall art and all that sort of thing in my mind. And I guess when I started my business, it was just natural to want to offer that to people. Um, I guess because I'd come from right at the very start, come from a film background where you don't really just hand over the negatives to people. Um, right. right. So, so I felt like the equivalent of like moving into digital, I still wanted to be able to offer people's tangible products. So I had a price list and it was just a single page price list. I had prints. I used to sell just loose prints. Um, I've always sold canvases. I think I used to sell things like a box set of prints and and things like that. Um, I've kept all my old price lists and they're always interesting to look back on. Yes. Um, (laughs) But um, I've also always offered people digital files as well because I know that that's something that I value highly. And I like yep. to have. So I figure that's something that, that people like to have as well. So it's it's always been right from the very start. I've always offered both. Yep. Yeah. No, I loved offering digitals. And as long as they're priced appropriately, like yeah. I think I've had in over 10 years, one client who purchased just the digitals, maybe two. And that yep. one I know is moving out of the country. So they get a pass. That's fine. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it's priced in that, you know, if they purchase just the digitals, I'm pretty happy. And then the digitals, it becomes a, a no brainer to like, oh, but I could spend really the same amount and get this beautiful product and add on some digitals. And it just, exactly. they, they get what they want. I'm selling them what I want to sell them and what I know they're going to enjoy for the long term. Because my biggest fear is they'll get those digitals and they'll sit in a, in a drawer forever. And they won't actually get to enjoy them. So yeah, I feel like they they work hand in hand so well. Exactly. Yeah. And you can have the best of both worlds and it's kind of win-win for everyone, I suppose. Yeah. I did actually used to do, as I had a bunch of different packages I used to offer. I've been through so many different types of pricing. It's crazy. I did actually have, and this was a really good lesson for me to learn. I did actually have a package that was just the shoot and digitals. Um, uh-huh. And it was priced way too low. I think it was like four or 500 bucks, something like that. Yeah. Um, it wasn't all the digitals. I think it was 20 digitals um, and the session. Yep. And I was so busy. Like I got so many bookings. I was so busy. And then I realized at some point that I just wasn't making any money out of it. I was just right. putting way too many hours into into doing these sessions and people yep. were just walking away with the digitals and not buying anything because my it was always my aim to think, oh, okay, well, I'll include the digital in the session and then they can also, you know, have the option to buy prints and stuff. And I I didn't have things set up in such a way that made that easy for people. So, and that was another mistake, I guess. So that was, I actually learned quite a lot doing that. And it was, I felt like if it was something I needed to actually go through to learn (laughs) and to understand why that didn't work. So in a way it was kind of a good thing, I guess. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> Not at the yeah. time. No, I think <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's hard to realize because you look at it on the surface and you're like, oh, it's definitely profitable. I have like mm. no cost of goods and, yep. you know, it's a couple hundred dollars and I just shoot and I edit. But then you start to look at how much time you're spending, which I know you, you are like a spreadsheet numbers nerd as much as I am. Like mm-hmm. we both geek out over productivity yep. stuff. So you <laughs> track your time. Have you always yes. been tracking your time for your clients? I think maybe not right at the start. 
Yeah. But I'm pretty sure around the same time as I was doing the digital packages, I started yeah. thinking, okay, I really need to start keeping track of the hours that I'm spending because it feels like a lot. Right. Um, and so I use a little app called Harvest and yeah. it just sits up in your, your menu bar at the top and you have jobs set up for each client and you just record the time that you spend. And from then on, I've always recorded the time that I spend for every single client just to make sure that I'm being profitable. Um, yeah. Because it's so important. It's like your hours is, it's you, you can't ignore that information. You no, know, it's vital no. to actually working out if you're profitable and working out, you know, how much you should charge as well. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. And then you can see your, you know, how many hours you spent, how much yep. your sale was, what your cost of goods sold were. You can see your actual cost of goods sold like percentage wise. And then you can break down that profit into how many hours and see what your actual hourly rate you earned from yep. that client was. That um, is the important figure. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's the really important one. Yep. And, and then average. And you know, yeah. Go on. Good. No, go ahead. You finish. <laughs> uh, and then averaged out over a number of clients. And I, that, yeah. I guess that is more like your true hourly rate as yeah. well. So, because it obviously varies between clients. Yeah. But yeah. yeah. And I was going to say, you have to add in, make sure you add in some time for like the admin tasks and things like of that course. that you're not really, yeah. you know. But if you're tracking those too as a separate thing, then you could really even look at a month or two of data, add up all the hours you've yeah. worked for your business, and then all the profit that you have and get a true rate of your hourly rate. I think if a lot of people exactly. did that, they'd be um, shocked. not pleasantly <laughs> surprised. <laughs> <laughs> I think, yeah, shocked. <laughs> would be uh-huh. the thing. Yeah, yeah. Cause it's amazing the time that you spend on all these little things that you don't, I mean, I, I'll, I can spend the whole day just answering emails. Yep. Yeah. It's crazy. And it's, you, it's hard because we love, yeah, we love our business. So like, I mean, yeah. I love my business, but I also Same. want to enjoy things outside of my business. So, yes. you know, it it's so important to be able to, to keep an eye on that. There's exactly. another app too. There's Harvest that you use and there's um, mm. Toggle, T-O-G-G-L. Um, yep. There's no E, uh, yep. which you I know Toggle's free. I think Harvest has different levels, but um, yeah, both great, great things to, to track time with. So we definitely recommend that. Yeah. Anything that makes it um, easy, basically. So yeah, so yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Whatever works into your workflow. Absolutely. Yeah. So where I know you shoot all over and you have the um, beautiful, wonderful beaches and gorgeous <laughs> areas that are just open and lovely. Where's your favorite session location? Uh, I'd say probably the beach. But yeah. um, just because it's like the beach on a sunny afternoon, there's just I I feel there's so many possibilities for different yeah. ways you can you can use the light and the variety that you can get and using different lenses to create variety and and the other thing is is people and dogs just seem to be happy and carefree at the beach. It's yeah. not as stressful. It's like a completely the opposite of a stressful place to be. It's a de- what's the word? It's a very relaxing place to be. <laughs> yes, yeah. Absolutely. Um, so often people can feel a little bit pressured or something or a little bit out of their comfort zone. And if they just feel a little bit off, then that can kind of show in the photos and it can pass to the dogs as well. Right. Um, whereas if people are relaxed and the dogs are having fun, you get a lot more um, a lot more chance of getting really nice expressions and, and those sorts of things, which are really important for creating great photos as well. So I guess for a number of reasons, I love the beach. Yeah, um, nice. My second favorite location would definitely be the forest so yeah we have we have plant we don't actually have native pine forests here in Australia um, but we have plantation pine forests and they're kind of the next best thing so I just well, I that just really almost like- is the person that likes you know the the repetitive like lined up things I imagine yes. those are pretty straight lined <laughs> and like you're like oh look at the repeating patterns <laughs> yeah yeah they definitely can yeah they often are and then they have like a road through the middle often as oh, well because, they've yes. got a, because they're a forestry like they've got to all be accessible so there's sort of roads all through them and they're not always lined up with the sunset either so I've gotten to know like which roads through the forest line up at particular times of year um, yep. which is it's really handy to know and I also use that Sunseeker app which is yes. amazing yep. for the is it augmented reality is that how you say it I have no it? idea <laughs> 
<laughs> There's a term for it. I think it's that. I may have pronounced it incorrectly. I'm not sure. Um, anyway, it's where it's where you hold your phone up and it uses the phone's camera and does an overlay. Yes, yeah, so of where the like, sun will be. Yeah, of, of the path of the sun through the sky and all that sort of stuff. And you can also change it to different months as well. So if you're there in June and you want to know where the sun sets in December, yep. you can switch it and it'll show you exactly. So you'd be like, okay, well, this, this particular view isn't working at the moment, but in another four months, it'll be lined up perfect. Um, yeah. Yeah. So yeah, Perfect. I love, I yeah. use that a lot. And it's, I mean, it's not so important at places like the beach, but definitely in the forest where you really need to get the sun in the right spot. Otherwise yes. you're dealing with like dappled shade and side light and all that sort of stuff. Um, yep. It's invaluable. I love it. I, yeah, I love that app. I use it a lot too. And um, I didn't realize because, you know, I don't, I don't live in the big giant, like rocky, beautiful mountains. So when I was yeah. out in Colorado with um, Taryn Bear, we were teaching a hair of the dog workshop a couple years ago. Uh, yeah. We were like, yep. oh, okay, two years, two, two years, two hours <laughs> before sunsets this time. This is when we'll start shooting. And we went out to scope <laughs> and then we took out my sun seeker. Yeah. I'm like, oh man, we're going to yeah. lose light behind that mountain <laughs> like yep. at four in the afternoon. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And that's just so, it's such vital information to have uh-huh. in those sorts of locations. I found the same thing in New Zealand as well. Yes. Like, because because Craig and I went to scout in, in uh, Queenstown um, yep. before the actual workshop. And it was like, we spent, oh, was it four days, three or four days driving uh-huh. around. We did so many Ks. We walked so far just to find locations where that wasn't going to be an issue. It wasn't going to be right. as much of an issue, I suppose. Yeah. Because it's a real thing. Mountains, it's just, it wrecks everything. <laughs> That's, they're they're tough. But... They're really hard to shoot in. Um, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And then for the workshops too, you're at the, the extra, you know, added challenge of it needs to be close to roads. We can't have people walking too far. We yep. can't have models walking too far. It can't parking. be too crowded. It needs to be enough room. Yep. Yeah. It's a tall yep. order. <laughs> yeah. I'm so glad we location scouted there beforehand just because if we would have just turned up and gone to places that we'd kind of thought we'd Googled about, right, um, right. a lot of the places that we thought were an absolute ring in weren't. So. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. It was yeah. Super handy. And I think, I think that's true with um, with actual photo shoot locations for your clients as well, because yep. sometimes like that's why I like to have a location guide that I send through to people that has locations, tried and tested locations that I know are yep. going to work at particular times of year. Uh, if you start doing shoots uh, at locations that the clients recommended because they think it's a pretty place. They're not looking for the right. same things as you are. <laughs> yep. So what they think is a great location. Yeah. There's a yeah. gazebo here. It'll be beautiful. <laughs> yeah. You're like, no, no, no. Yeah. A completely open manicured park with like no interest. You're like, no, no, no. Yeah. no. <laughs> or their backyard. That's all. Yeah, yeah. We'll just do it, do it in my backyard. And so I always Google before we yes. have that conversation, I usually have their address. So I Google that yeah. first. So to see, oh, you live on 10 acres of like natural land. Okay. Yeah. We could probably make mm-hmm. that work. Or, exactly. oh, you're in a subdivision on a third of an acre with a white fence in your backyard. Yeah. Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. But um, alternatively, like I've actually had a, a few locations that clients have, and I'm always super skeptical when clients recommend yeah. locations because nine times out of 10, they're not suitable. Um, but I've actually had a couple of locations that I've found because a client has recommended them as well. So um, it does help also to keep an open mind and not just discount locations straight away because you're like, oh, right. what, what would they know? Um, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> because sometimes they actually manage to get a good spot. Like there's there's one spot that I really love that I shoot at. It's kind of on the other side of town for me, which is also good because it's not a place I would have kind right. of like stumbled Bounce. across by myself. Yeah, because I didn't normally go there. But they take their dog every there every, there every afternoon, and it's an off leash park, but you can walk sort of further up the creek, and there's not as many people and dogs, and it's really oh, nice. pretty, and it's often really green because it's in a valley. So yeah. Finding locations it. is a huge, a huge part, I think, of, of being an outdoors natural light photographer. Yep. I, it's yeah, so important. I, absolutely. And I remember my, well, my brother got married last spring, thankfully not this spring, last May, where he got married. It was an outdoor venue and it was beautiful. And they had all this acreage and beautiful trees and some flowers and gorgeous mm-hmm. light and fields and old barns. And I'm like, oh my God, this is awesome. I want to <laughs> shoot here. And I yep. was thinking to myself, no chance they're going to let dogs here. And I almost didn't even yeah. ask. And then I had a client really right around that time. Um, they contacted me like a week or two after my brother got married and we were talking and we were trying to figure out where to go. And their dogs were a little reactive and, you know, they wanted someplace private. And so I was like, I'm going to 
hold on, let me get back to you tomorrow. <laughs> let me find out. So I emailed the people and I was like, you know, I'm a pet photographer. I know you guys, you know, because you look on the website and it says they do rent the, the land for photography, but they have cats, mm-hmm. they have a dog. I'm like, there's no way they're gonna let me bring dogs onto here. Yeah, so I just yep. emailed them and said, hey, I'm a pet photographer. Would I be able to hold a session there too? They're like, sure, absolutely. I'm like, oh, oh, wow. Okay. So that's awesome. It doesn't hurt to ask. Yeah. If you guys have locations, I find sometimes Googling when I first moved to Charlotte, I mean, I had been here like twice before. Oh man. You had your work cut out for you finding locations. Yeah. Yeah. And it's weird here a bit too, because it's very like just green trees, flat-ish, but not real hilly. Like in Pittsburgh, you can get up on things here. There's like yep. kind of hills, but the trees are so big. You can't ever see over the trees. Um, uh, so it's just like, I don't know. It was a whole different kind of scouting. And the city was totally different too, because Pittsburgh has amazing old architecture and incredible oh, old that. doors. And That's like, really cool. I could go shoot around the city. I had like uh, probably 10 different city locations that I love to shoot wow. out. And here I'm like, oh, here they like knock everything down if it's more than 20 years oh, old to build something new. I'm like, Brisbane yeah. too. <laughs> I'm like, nothing's yeah. exciting. <laughs> Um, yeah. So I've started to find some, but finding it was a little bit more challenging to start to find where I wanted to go. So what I actually did when I was going to move was I Googled, you know, wedding photography yeah. location Charlotte and yep. came up with some really good spots to to kind of check out and, and go see. And um, that's yeah, definitely a really some. good thing to look for. Yeah. yeah. Hidden you gems. know it's going to be photogenic. Yeah. yeah. Um, I actually did a really similar thing. Um, there's a place uh, in actually I live right. I've just moved like just before Christmas and it's just down the road from me now. It's called Old Petrie Town and it's a weird little place. It's like uh, Brisbane is pretty bad for retaining heritage areas and heritage yeah. buildings and they you know tend to knock things down and stuff. Um, So there's not a lot of old buildings, but this old Petrie town, they've actually moved a lot of the old buildings, even an entire railway station building. um, Oh, wow. and, And put them in this little village to like create this little old timer, you know, old in Australian terms is only like yeah. hundred years old, but <laughs> right, right. <laughs> this, this little village um, with lots of these cute little cottagey buildings and the old railway station with a little section of track and all these really cool places. Anyway, so I was actually looking at it as a wedding, <laughs> similar story to yours actually. Right. I was looking at it as a wedding location for myself and there's these beautiful big old fig trees, like 350 year old Morton Bay fig oh, trees, the big buttress roots. And yeah, so I ended up, ended up getting married there um but I, I did the same thing I just asked them the question like do you allow dogs here and it had actually just changed management so and the reason the reason I assumed it didn't before is there were actually signs there that said no dogs right. um but they just changed management and they're just like oh no we're letting people we're letting people have photography permits for shooting here now and yes we allow dogs so that's a really favorite spot of mine to shoot and again it's like a similar kind of reason as you I think is it's not crowded and it's a really great place to take reactive dogs because there's yeah. never anyone else there and no other dogs there. And if I've got a, you, you have to have a photography pass to shoot there, to be there. Yeah. I mean, just always ask the question, never be shy about asking, like, what's the worst thing that's going to happen? They're going to say no. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And I'm not scared to like pay for places and my clients Same. understand, yep. especially if they have a reactive dog and they say, hey, we can yep. go here, but it's private and there is a, a fee to shoot there. They're always like, okay, that's fine. <laughs> you know, and yeah, as an owner exactly. of a reactive dog myself, I mean, I would <laughs> yeah. pay in a second to know that I'm not going to have like Zoe barking and spinning and screaming. And it's, you know, so it's stressful for all of us. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it's definitely worth it. And um, private property as well. Actually, in my real shoot series, episode seven, I actually shoot on a, a in the country on a private property. Yeah. And I, I actually put a an ad up on Facebook looking for a, a suitable property in the area that I wanted that had certain features. Oh, nice. Um, about finding the property to shoot on. And that's where I shot in episode seven of Real Shoots. So also that's another way to find locations is you can actually eat, you can even just drive around the area that you like if it's a country area or something and see like a beautiful paddock or um, a really nice creek or, you know, some rolling hills or something or a field of flowers or, you know, crops or whatever looks good. Um, yeah. Just leave a, leave a note in their letterbox. Yep. Like, and, and if you actually offer to pay, people will take you seriously as well. Yes, um, and, and tell them you have insurance. <laughs> yes, exactly. You know, yep. like actually, you know, send them a link, give them a business card and, and tell them that you're like a legitimate sort of business and um 
that you are happy to pay to be able to shoot there. And it's always worth it. Yes. Always. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And you can find usually their names too. Um, you know, that's all county county um, public uh, knowledge that you can look on your county website to find out who owns it. You can send letters, you know, whatever. However, to reach them, that's a that's a great way to do that. What were you looking yeah. for on the private land? It was more, I guess, it was also what I wasn't looking for as well. Yeah. So I wasn't looking for a cluttered type place that had lots of, you know, old cars lying around or, right. um, you know, ugly fences and things like that. So I think in my list, I actually, in Real Shoots episode seven, I actually have a screenshot of the exact ad that I posted on Facebook looking for yeah. it. And so it was, um, I think I listed old farm buildings with a rustic yes. kind of look, yeah. um, paddocks that hadn't been mowed with natural long grasses, yeah. tracks, treed areas. I forget what else was in the list, but it was a list of things I did want and a list of things I didn't want. And I was also very specific that I, I wasn't shooting at their house. Right. Um, so, so we wouldn't be in their house, in and around their house, um, right, in their right. house yard or anything like that. It was only on their land, only on their property. And I also tried to find some example photos of what I was looking for and post those in the ad as well. Well, smart. Um, so, and then you and just that put that really in well. like local groups? Yeah, just a community Facebook group. It's in the yeah. area that I was looking in. Um, and I had so many responses. I reckon I had about 10 responses. Oh, that's nice. Um, and I went out to about four properties, I think. Yeah. Uh, and ended up choosing this one that I used for, for the Real Shoots episode. Nice. Only thing is, he was just about to sell it. <laughs> yeah. You're <laughs> so like, I when to you shoot- sell it, can you put in the contract that... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I need it stipulated that I am going to get access to it. <laughs> but, um, yeah, no, I, I actually only shot there once because it changed owners and, and they weren't interested. Um, <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's so sad. <laughs> You're like, all right, let me call number two that was on my list. Yeah, like, remember me. Uh, that's right. Yeah. And there is one that I would love to to go out to still. I just haven't found the perfect shoot to do it with yet. Um, yeah. But yeah, it's a good way of finding locations to shoot if you're really struggling. And also for people who struggle, they might live in an area where the laws are quite tight on. Oh, um, uh, that's Florida. Oh, is you, it? Okay. Oh my God. You cannot have dogs like anywhere. It's really? so frustrating. Oh, it's really hard. That is frustrating. I think Sydney's a little bit the same as well. It's definitely a lot more um, tightly restricted, I guess. There's, yeah. there's certain places you can't even, that it's completely dog prohibited. I found that actually about the inner city parks of Brisbane, like right in the city too. Mm-hmm. A lot of them are just no dogs, um, which is which is kind of annoying. Which is crazy uh, too, because so many dogs live in the city. <laughs> they exactly. need to go they're, to supposed, they're just supposed to stay in their apartments full time. Yeah. Oh, and they want to end up having issues because they're not socialized well enough. But anyway, that's a different topic. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. Yeah. Um, what are some other ways that you, I know when I moved down, I did some, some armchair Googling, um, yes. looking for green yep. spaces and. Yep. That's a great way to do it. Stuff. Yeah. Just scrolling I, around the map. Yeah. 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 And then every time I go driving somewhere, I'm always always looking around for where I am. And I actually will take, if I'm like in the city and I see, oh my gosh, here's this beautiful like red garage door that I could shoot at. I Mm. I take a picture on my phone and like drop a little pin where it is. And I put it in a specific folder. So I kind of have this little folder of cool spots. Yeah. That's a good idea. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I have a question for you. So when you're looking for like a session location for a full session, Mm. like how many different kind of vignettes or areas do you want to see to be able to get enough variety for the session you want? Oh, okay. Like so variety within the one location. Yeah. Yeah. Like so because I know there's some places that I've done many sessions at, but sometimes it's a little bit harder to do a full session at. Yeah. It really depends on how you, I mean, I've got, I mean, I've got a location guide and I think I've got about 18 different locations in there. And I think only, only one of them I specify that I'll only do a short session there. Yep. Also mainly because of the light and you, it's only a morning mm. location and you lose the light really quickly so you don't actually have yep. a lot of time to shoot there. And also there isn't a lot of variety. So there's basically just a creek and then like a field yep. and it's all very same, same. Yep. Um, you're not going to get a lot of variety there. I don't know. I suppose I look for... I suppose I look for three or four or five different kind of areas, but it's also yeah. in how you use them as well. Right, right. Um, so you can get a completely different look from exactly the same spot just by changing your lens and changing your focal length. Yeah, and or your perspective. A different angle. Yep. Yeah, 
Um, Absolutely. So it kind of really depends, I suppose. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I would rarely shoot. I would rarely go to a location because there's like a building there that I like and just use that building in the yeah. background. That's just yeah. not, well, it's not really my style, I suppose, but it's also just doesn't give you quite enough um, right. variety both with different colored backgrounds and stuff. Yeah. My favorite places to shoot. I love the city. I still love the city yeah. and like to go with to go. buildings <laughs> and color, you know, texture and everything. And it's funny because people are always like, man, I want to do the city, but I love the natural stuff too. And I'm like, well, but we can do both because Yay. you know, with that trusty 70 to 200 at 200 millimeters, yeah. you're like, Oh, here's a couple grasses. Oh, it looks like yeah. we're in the middle of wherever. Like you have no it's idea it's in the city. Nowhere. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah absolutely. You can really hone down on those tiny little patches of, of something to, to make it look a little bit different. Yeah. Yeah. I think of um, a really fun exercise. I do it in one of um, my behind the lens episodes in the Academy yeah. that basically oh, it was yeah, in front of the door. Yeah. This That little like town, that, yeah. I love yeah. that little town. It was like 10 minutes from my house. It's like a little kind of historic-ish, a historical town, but there's just really like this little town square that's kind of historical. And then otherwise it's just normal houses and like a restaurant. And really oh, yeah. you would drive right through and be like, there's nothing really special here. But like there was plenty and there was never anybody there and it was close and it was great. You could shoot in the morning, but you didn't have to get there at like sunrise. You could like start an hour oh, after sunshine. <laughs> It was amazing. <laughs> um, but anyway, I did, I digress. I did a, uh, a, a little exercise at a door and it was like, all right, let's see how many different images we can create like right here in this spot, not at this building, like right here at this door. Mm -hmm. So yep. I always feel like that's a really good way it for, is. yeah, you know, to like explore your creativity and start to see some things and how many different ways can I use this with different lenses and different perspectives and all exactly. that good stuff. Yeah, I yeah. did a similar thing in uh, Real Shoots episode six with Nikki the Husky. Um, yeah. It was basically just a garden bed. And the, the, the difference in the images that you can get, she was standing in the garden bed and I was kind of shooting from a long way away with a 200 millimeter lens and I got her kind of, you know, side on standing there. And yep. then I switched to a super wide angle lens and I shot over the top of her looking down. In, yep. She was pretty much in exactly the same position. She, yeah. she didn't move at all. Um, and it looked like it was like a completely different photo completely right. different look. And it's just amazing what you can do just by mixing it up a little bit. I think people sometimes get stuck using their favorite lens. Yeah, oh, I'm guilty, <laughs> guilty. Um, yeah, with 70 to 200. I mean, it's a good lens. I mean, <laughs> it's, on, it it's on my camera most of the time. But I feel like if I'm, if I'm getting a bit stuck and I'm, I'm like, I think to myself, oh, what lens am I using? How long have I been? Okay, I've been using it for the last 15 minutes. Let me just switch. Yep. And I can't see anything that I want to do with this lens, but let me just put it on and have a look and then often when you put it on you start looking through you know looking through the viewfinder and look like you get a set of fresh eyes I guess on the same scene so just yeah. that act of switching to a different lens just um it, it can give you a bit of inspiration and sort of help you work through it and, and use your creativity to create something different yeah yeah and don't be afraid to tell you know tell your client like to test something different and if it's not working like to say oh all right hold on let's go do it this way or i'm going to switch my lens like mm. your client's not going to judge you if you're like trying something you're like mm, i don't really like that exactly. i'm going to come over here like i when i first started i was terrified that <laughs> a one if i wasn't constantly moving and shooting that they yeah. were going to realize they didn't know what the heck i was doing and <laughs> B, if I like, you know, pause for a second or told them, oh, wait, this isn't working, that they'd be like, oh, see, who, why, why are you calling yourself a professional? <laughs> I think we all have that like through the back of our head, especially when we're starting. Exactly. Yeah. But then I realized that, oh, no, it's totally okay to say, hey, just hang out here for one second. I'm going to walk over here and see if there's anything interesting. I want to go check the yep. light here. I tell them, hold on, I'm, I'm going to change these settings. I take a couple test shots. I'll sometimes say, oh, I don't really like it with that lens. Hold on, I'm going to switch to this. Like they, yep. that, they don't care. <laughs> so. is part of the, it's, it's all part of the creative process. And, and yeah. people kind of really appreciate that sometimes too, I think, because you're trying to do something a bit different from them for them. You're not just taking them to the same spot you take every single client to and taking the same photo. Um, yeah. I find that the, especially the, the old Petri town that I shoot at 
with the, the little village. There's so many different nooks and crannies of that place that I'm always finding new spots. And I will say to a client, look, I shoot here all the time, but I've never shot just over there. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, let's go try that out and see how that looks. Um, yeah. And they're always like, oh, okay, cool. We're doing something a bit different. Like we might get something really cool out of this. And if it doesn't yeah. work, they're like, oh, Oh, well, that's okay. Let's try this other spot, you know. Yeah. Um, I think it, it gives you time to regroup your thoughts and stuff as well. If you just, that's that's yeah. one of the tips that I give often is if you're feeling a little bit overwhelmed during a session, because um, there's so much to think about, so much to think about. And, and a lot of the time it does start to come more naturally, the more shoots that you do. But when you're first starting out, like, I mean, you got to talk to them, you got to make conversation with people often that's the hardest thing right <laughs> because we're all so many people are drawn to pet photography because they're introverts and they right. don't necessarily love talking to people but unfortunately dogs aren't their own free agents and you still right. have to talk to the people yes the, um, the people have the purse strings <laughs> that's right yeah so you're thinking about talking making conversation with and talking to the owner you're thinking about the dog what's it doing is it happy is it behaving is there any like extra training you need to do with the dog and then you're thinking about the light which is another huge huge thing thinking about how to use the location you're thinking about settings on your camera Right. Um, shooting with manual, you're constantly thinking about, oh, do I need to adjust the ISO to, to account for the light? So many different things you're thinking about. And it's really easy to get overwhelmed. And that's normal. That's like totally normal. Yep. Um, so one of the little tips that I give to people is often if you get, if you're feeling a bit overwhelmed, if you're a bit over talking for a minute, you can just get people to hang out in a particular little spot and go, okay, I'm just going to walk over. You guys stay here. Just hang out for a sec. Give your dog a drink, whatever. I'm just going to have a walk over here and see what this spot over here looks like because I haven't shot there before and I just want to go and line it up. Yep. And you can actually use that as a little break for yourself yep. to like yep. regroup and calm down and just center yourself a little bit. And you might walk over there for just a couple of minutes and it's just enough to, for you to reset yourself and get in a better frame of mind. And then by the time you come back, regardless of whether that spot that you checked out is going to work or not. By the time you come back, you're just a little bit more calm. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, <laughs> and I, I find I use that as like a reset button in the middle of a session. Yeah, no, that's good. And, you know, and the dogs can usually use a little break and the people, exactly. like everyone, everyone appreciates a little break here and there. So... Yeah, exactly. don't be afraid to do that. Oh, my yeah, gosh. I it. think we could go on on this conversation for like oh three more God. hours. <laughs> I think so, too. Quite easily. We could talk all day, Nicole. <laughs> You're like, hey, everybody, this is like our seven-hour podcast episode. <laughs> Man, it's blog it's now yeah. four in the morning. Um, yeah. <laughs> we still you have so much to talk about. <laughs> you must listen all in one sitting. Oh, yes. Anyway, um, yeah, well, I'm sure I'll have you on the podcast again because we have so many cool. awesome things things to talk about. Uh, okay. Thank you for being here with us. Why don't you let everybody know, you know, where to find you and all that good stuff. Cool. Okay. Um, so if you'd like to follow my actual photography business, that's called Charlotte Reeves Photography. And that the URL the website is just charlottereeves.com.au. Uh, and then I have the teaching side of things. So I do quite a lot of teaching these days. And my website for that is learnpetphotography.com. So on that teaching side of things, I do in-person mentoring. Obviously can't really do in-person person right now. <laughs> um, but I also do online mentoring and I've been doing a lot of that lately. And that's a really good way to connect with me online. I do portfolio reviews and we can even just have a bit of a chat about any, you know, issues that you're facing and want to just talk through with someone. I've also got my real shoots course, which is 10 episodes. So 10 real shoots with actual dog photography clients. Uh, so there's like a shooting for each episode. There's a shooting video. There's two editing tutorials. There's a PDF guide. There's the full client gallery and there's a quiz. Uh, so love it. That times 10. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. It's an amazing course. Thanks, Nicole. Yeah, that's a huge, huge course. But what I recommend people always start with is I do have a free daily tips series that you can sign up to via email. And that's basically one tip every day for 90 days. Nice. So that's three months worth of daily tips. And they're just nice little bite-sized, easily digestible tips that just turn up in your email inbox every day. Um, and a lot of people find those really helpful. They're good little snippets of information. So I always recommend people start with that. Um, I've also got a 
blog that's got a bunch of different information on there about all manner of things. I've got a really popular post on there about shooting action, um, which is something that a lot of people are really interested in doing and also something that a lot of people struggle with for various reasons. So that's 10 tips for action. That's on my blog. And what I recommend people actually start with in terms of courses, I have an awesome course called Working with Natural Light. And I developed developed this course because I feel that people's ability to work with natural light during pet photography sessions especially uh, is absolutely fundamental in your success. The, The ability to be able to just instantly understand what the light is doing, the quality of the light, um, finding spots to shoot at because of the light. So saying, okay, I can't shoot over there because the light's not good. I'll come back there later. It it sort of helps to guide the flow of your session almost, um, depending on which spots are good to shoot at as the light changes throughout the afternoon. Um, So your understanding of light basically underpins everything else, I think, if you're an outdoors natural light pet photographer. And also the way that the light interacts with your pet subjects as well. It's a little bit different than working with people because you're working with all manner of different shapes and sizes and colors of subject as well. So that light aspect of your photography is so important. So my course working with natural light, I recommend people do that actually before they dive into uh, real shoots because it it forms a really good foundation. And it also is a really good little introduction to, I guess, my teaching style as well. Um, So you kind of understand what to expect in if you decide to jump into real shoots. If you kind of enjoy the way that I present the information working with natural light, well, there's definitely more of that in real shoots as well as video, which is awesome in real shoots. So yeah, that's the rundown. <laughs> awesome. I love it. And they can't get rid of you that easily too, because you're also in the Academy, the Hair of the Dog Academy, yeah. giving critiques there. So good, good. Yeah. Lots of places to keep okay. up with you, Charlotte. And um, thank you again for being here with us. And I'm sure we'll talk to you again soon. Awesome. Thanks so much for having me on, Nicole. Of course. Talk to you soon. If you enjoy this podcast episode, go ahead and take a screenshot of this episode on your phone and post it up there on your Instagram stories and be sure to tag us at Hair of the Dog Academy. And we would just love to see how you're listening. And uh, full disclosure, sometimes we just like to give away a little pet photographer swag in the form of Hair of the Dog t-shirts and sweatshirts. So what are you waiting for? Go ahead and share that screenshot of this episode and don't forget to tag us at Hair of the Dog Academy. And while you're there, maybe you want to jump on over to our account and see what we're up to on the gram. Would love to connect with you. Thanks for listening to the Hair of the Dog podcast. This was episode number 115. If you want to check out the show notes for access to any of the resources that we mentioned, simply go to www.hairofthedogacademy.com slash 115. listening to this episode of hair of the dog podcast if you enjoyed this show please take a minute to leave a review and while you're there don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss our upcoming episodes one last thing if you are ready to dive into more resources head over to our website at www.hairofthedogacademy.com thanks for being a part of this pet photography community